In this video, I'll be covering the four basic operations and some of their properties. This topic may seem rudimentary to some, but in any field and at any level, it's really important to have a good grasp of the fundamentals. I think there's a widely held misconception that math is just a bunch of formulas that you have to memorize and blindly apply to specific problems. With this video, I hope to show that math is actually rooted in intuition and understanding by getting at the very foundation of arithmetic and the logic that anchors it to the ground. We'll start with the commutative property of addition. It states that when adding two numbers, the order of the numbers doesn't matter, and you can switch them around freely. In order to understand why this is, we need to remember that numbers aren't just symbols, and that they actually represent quantities. Addition means finding the total, or sum, of two numbers when they're combined. With this in mind, it's pretty easy to see why switching the inputs would keep the output constant. The associative property of addition states that it doesn't matter what order you do the addition in, the result will still be the same. Once again, it's pretty easy to see why this is the case. At this point, you might be thinking that the associative property is the same thing as the commutative property, since they both say that order doesn't matter. However, there's an important distinction to be made. The commutative property states that the order of inputs doesn't matter, whereas the associative property states that the order of evaluation doesn't matter. These are actually different, and there are things that are associative but not commutative, as well as things that are commutative but not associative. Subtraction represents taking a number away from another number and counting what's left. It's the inverse of addition, which means that subtracting reverses the process of adding. It's difficult to talk about subtraction without talking about negative numbers, which are numbers that are less than zero. And this is where, just for a moment, we have to change the way we've been thinking about numbers. Imagine that instead of representing blocks, numbers represent the number of steps you are to the right of a certain starting point. Increasing the number would mean moving to the right, and decreasing the number would mean moving to the left. In this case, unlike with numbers of physical objects, it actually makes sense to decrease this number past zero, since space extends infinitely in all directions. On the number line, addition is represented with a shift to the right by a certain amount, and a negative shift to the right is the same as a shift to the left. Therefore, adding a negative number is the same as subtracting a positive number, and all properties of addition can be applied to subtraction with this in mind. Multiplication represents groups of numbers. For example, 5 times 4 is defined as the total, or product, when you have 5 groups of 4. This can be thought of as adding 4 to itself 5 times. Like addition, multiplication is both commutative and associative. Let's start with talking about why it's commutative. That is, why the order of the inputs doesn't matter. Unlike with addition, it might not be immediately obvious why this is the case at first. Why would 4 groups of 3 be equal to 3 groups of 4? You could reason that when going from 4 groups of 3 to 3 groups of 4, you're decreasing the number of groups, but you're increasing the size of each group, giving you something that's close to the original. But how do we know that switching the inputs doesn't change the result at all? Well, consider this grid that's 4 blocks wide and 3 blocks tall. You'll notice that it can be split up into 4 groups of 3, or 3 groups of 4. And this is true of any two numbers. Another way to think about it would be to take the first block in each group and put them in a group, then take the second block in each group and put them in a group, and so on. What you'll end up with is an arrangement where the size of each group is equal to the number of groups before, and the number of groups is equal to the size of each group before. We were able to rearrange the blocks into a formation that was simply the reverse of what we had before, so therefore you can freely switch the inputs of multiplication without changing the result. This is essentially the same as the first explanation, but it might make it a bit more clear what we're actually doing when we arrange the blocks into a grid. As for the associative property of multiplication, it might be easiest to think in three dimensions. If we take three groups of four and stack two of those, and compare it to what we get when we take two groups of three and stack four of those, we see that both give us the same shape, just rotated. So the order in which the multiplication is done doesn't change the result. The next thing we'll talk about is the distributive property of multiplication over addition, which states that when multiplying by the sum of two or more numbers, the multiplication can also be applied to each of those numbers individually. To understand why, imagine we have groups of four, and the total number of groups we have is two plus three. We can split these groups up into two groups of four and three groups of four, and of course, we can do this for any number. 
we can also apply the distributive property in reverse, which is called factoring. Let's say we have four groups of some unknown number x, and we're adding five groups of x. We know that in total, we have four plus five groups of x. This is sometimes also referred to as combining like terms, particularly in situations like this, where a variable is being factored out, leaving behind a constant. Division is tied to the idea of splitting a number up into some number of equal groups and taking the size of each group. For example, when you divide 6 into 3 groups, each group ends up having a size of 2. And just like how subtraction is the inverse of addition, division is the inverse of multiplication. Oftentimes when we divide, we're forced to split a single block into pieces. In the case of 1 divided by 2, we're left with a number that's between 0 and 1. Non-whole numbers like these, that are expressed as a number divided by another number, are called fractions. Imagine we have three rectangles that each represent one, and we take the entire thing and split it into five equal groups, and look at the size of one of the groups. You'll notice that we have three pieces, and each of these pieces is just one divided by five, so dividing by a number is the same as multiplying by one divided by that number, also known as that number's reciprocal. Because of this, fractions can be thought of as having a denominator, which determines how small each piece is, or more specifically, how many of those pieces fit into one, and a numerator, which determines how many of those pieces we take. Now that we know how to express non-whole numbers as fractions, the question now is how to perform operations on them. We'll start with adding fractions. Let's say we want to find the sum of one-half and one-third. We're dealing with pieces of different sizes, so how would we go about finding the total? Fractions have a property where the numerator and denominator can both be multiplied or divided by the same number without changing the value of the fraction, which is hopefully made clear by this diagram. Normally, we would always want to write our fractions in simplest form, making the numerator and denominator as small as possible. But when adding fractions, we can take advantage of this property to make all pieces the same size. One way to do this that's guaranteed to work is by scaling each fraction by the other's denominator. Once all pieces are the same size, we just need to add numerators to get the total number of pieces. When multiplying two fractions, the result is just the product of the numerators divided by the product of the denominators. To understand why, consider this rectangle. Let's say we want to multiply 3 sevenths by 2 fifths. If this rectangle represents 1, then we can represent 3 sevenths by splitting it into 7 pieces and taking 3 of them. And now we need to multiply this by 2 fifths, and that means splitting what we have into 5 pieces and taking 2 of them. What we're left with is the product of the two fractions. You'll notice that the number of pieces in the highlighted portion is 3 times 2, the product of the numerators, and the total number of pieces is 7 times 5, the product of the denominators. And our final answer is just the ratio of these two numbers. So these are the basic tools and concepts that are used to manipulate expressions. By applying these rules and building upon them, we're able to solve incredibly complex problems and derive truths that aren't obvious at first glance. And that's part of what makes math so beautiful. However, the further you go in math, the easier it is to take these rules for granted. If there's one thing you take away from this video, I want you to remember that when learning math, it's incredibly important to maintain that connection between the symbols you see on paper and the intuition of what they represent and why they make sense. It's only by staying rooted to the fundamentals that we can begin to truly understand the quantitative relationships that form the basis of the world around us.